Hi, I'm Dr. Donna Skerritt. I'm Chief Medical Officer of Mesoblast, and we are sponsoring this event today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Carl June. In recent years, cell-based immunotherapy has emerged with significant contributions in the challenging areas of cancer and chronic infection. At the forefront is Dr. Carl June, the Richard W. Vague Professor in Immunotherapy and Director of the Translational Research Program at the University of Pennsylvania's Perlman School of Medicine. Dr. June's research has elucidated mechanisms of lymphocyte activation that relate to immune tolerance and adoptive immunotherapy. Noted examples of Dr. June's translational research include the de development of chimeric antigen receptor T cells, better known as CAR T cells, for treatment of cancers such as leukemia. Additionally, he's developed zinc finger nuclease-based gene editing for CCR5 in autologous CD4 T cells of persons infected with HIV. <coughs> His work has led to an exclusive global research and licensing agreement between Novartis and the University of Pennsylvania's Industry Academic Partnership to further study and develop novel cellular immunotherapies using CAR technologies. Dr. June is extensively published, and he is the recipient of numerous prizes and honors. This includes his election to the Institute of Medicine in 2012, the William B. Coley Award, and the Richard V. Smalley Award from the Society of Immunotherapy of Cancer in 2013. This year, Fierce Biotech noted Dr. June as the most influential academic scientist in the biopharmaceutical industry. Mesoblast is pleased to again sponsor this public forum with the Stanford, Stanford, Stanford Consortium of Regenerative Medicine, where Dr. Carl June tonight will discuss engineered T cells for cancer in an area of synthetic biology, challenges and opportunities. Without further ado, please a warm welcome for Dr. June. Uh, thanks very much, Donna, and um, it's really uh, great to be here. So I spoke in May earlier this year, and what I hope to show is that we've had uh, progress since then. Um, and, and a disclosure is uh, our relationship with Novartis. Um, so we've had, you know, a real awakening in cancer immunotherapy where there was a really a, a, literally a century with um, little progress. And then we've had uh, in the last uh, years since 2011, numerous new breakthroughs um, in both antibody-based therapy and cell-based therapy. And I'll cover some of the cell-based therapies. And that was, you know, uh, recognized this December, um, last December now, with Science Magazine's um, uh, statement that T cells are, were the number one um, breakthrough in science, in, uh, in, in all of science and engineering. So what, um, this is is a is a slide from a paper that Dean um, Felscher did at Stanford, not Stanford, but at Stanford, <laughs> and uh, and in Stanford, what he showed was uh, this experiment where if you make two different kinds of leukemia in mice by activating either the so-called Philadelphia chromosome BCR able or CMYK, you get leukemia, and those model human kinds of leukemia, then. Um, if you do this in a normal mouse, what happens is, is that uh, the leukemia goes away, and then if you get rid of the driver oncogene, the leukemia, the mice become cured. But what he did then was an experiment that the pharmaceutical companies had to do. So this is the rationale for targeted therapeutics. Get rid of the driver, and cancer goes away. But if you do it in an immunodeficient mouse, this is what happened. Um, the tumor, when he got rid of the tumor uh, oncogene, the tumor went away transiently, but then recurred. So you need the immune system to have a long-term cure there because there's some leak through in this driver system. And, and that's probably true for human cancers that you need an immune system uh, to prevent escape mutations. Um, so we're here at this point now in cancer where we've had an expanding 
toolbox where in the past it was just surgery and radiation and on, um, chemotherapy, and now we have a number of other modalities that employ the immune system in various ways. Uh, one um, characteristic that you can say is basically the initial therapies, radiation and and chemotherapy were thought mainly to target the tumor, whereas these immunotherapies target really the host. So then they are directed against the patient's immune system, and the immune system then is what it can then target the cancer. Um, and um, a, a lot of work from basic immunology now has shown that cancers um, evolve in patients. So by the time they're diagnosed in a patient, um, there are subclones, and that there is actually immune surveillance. It was a controversial area for a long time, but it's now shown via a number of ways that the, the patient's immune system, in many cases, can recognize a tumor without any kind of vaccination and then call that tumor out. Um, and that then can lead to elimination. And then Bob Schreiber has shown that that can also lead to, if it doesn't completely eliminate the tumor, to immunoediting um, so that the tumor becomes sculpted and then later can escape and then come out. And so it's not the same tumor that started. And when it comes out then, there's, that's it's a, something immunologists call as tolerance. So we have immune tolerance and checkpoint therapy, which is what I had on that initial slide with antibodies like ipilimumab and uh, nivolumab, uh, aim to overcome tolerance by stopping the checkpoints that, that induce tolerance. Um, and CAR therapies, get at the same thing, but using a different approach in, involving synthetic biology with engineered T cells. So um, I think both um, approaches will be used. Um, and this is really what we have now, because tolerance is why we had 100 years where tumor immunotherapy didn't work. So there's a number of approaches. We have a, a review in blood that discuss these, but um, there are a number of cells that can maintain tolerance where we have coexistence peacefully of the tumor in a patient. Even though they have an immune response against it, the tumor is not eliminated. So checkpoint blockade is, is a major approach, and that's being pursued by pharmaceutical companies again, uh, and numerous companies, um, blocking molecules that put the brakes on the immune system so that um, the cancer is not eliminated. On the bottom is what I'll discuss, which is the use of adoptively transferred cells, or really cell infusions. And there's three times, types now that will be FDA approved in the next several years. So one are so-called TIL therapy, or tumor in infiltrating lymphocytes. In melanoma, these are natural T cells that are grown from surgical biopsies. And um, numerous centers now have shown that this works in, in uh, um, metastatic melanoma, where drugs have not previously. And then there are two forms of engineered T cells, one being chimeric antigen receptor cells, or CAR cells, and then the other T cell receptor engineered cells that can be used to overcome tolerance. And uh, I believe both of these approaches will be um, FDA approved since when I was here last in the spring. Um, uh, Adapt Immune and GSK have partnered now to commercialize trans, uh, T cell receptors that are introduced into T cells. Um, and this works then by making a bispecific T cell. The T cell retains its endogenous receptor, and then one of choice can be engineered in that will then um, have the specificity that's desired. The CAR approach um, is similar in that a bispecific cell is also made, but it combines an antibody approach with, um, rather than the T cell receptor. So this is different in that the antibodies bind to the tumor surface rather than the T cell receptor, which binds to peptides in HLA molecules on the surface of the tumor cell. So there's a different mechanism of recognition. This is more off the shelf in that it doesn't have to be matched to the patient's HLA. Those are the transplantation antigens. And then when tumor binds to this, um, a tumor cell binds to this CAR, um, then that then signals a T cell through molecules that are similar to what's in the T cell receptor, resulting in T cell proliferation and killing of the tumor. And this cartoon uh, shows some of that. If, if you start with, we start with peripheral blood cells from a patient, they may be a T cell that might be, for instance, an influenza specific cell, so it has its T cell receptor that would help uh, for viral infections. And then we use various ways, and I'm going to discuss either lentiviral vectors or RNA electroporation to introduce the CAR um, construct into the T cell. Um, and then 
um, we have constitutive promoters that make this then uh, expressed all the time on the T cell then. So now it's a bispecific T cell. It has an antibody that we can at will change its specificity for tumors um, and it retains its endogenous T cell receptor. Um, and then this now will kill, in this case, any uh, cell that expresses CD19, which is on normal B cells and leukemia cells. And when it does that, it does it in a way that's non-cross-resistant with most forms of chemotherapy. So that's an event. T cells have many ways to kill, and it's very hard for tumor cells to become resistant to T cells, whereas with a single point mutation can do that with most targeted therapeutics. Um, so as I alluded, I think both of these approaches will um, become incorporated into medicine for various kinds of cancers and infectious diseases. Um, um, and, you know, we're at the area now where phar both pharmaceutical industry and biotechnology is now invested in, in scaling this out, and I'll describe some of the issues that remain. But the T-cell receptor is inherently more sensitive than a car. Um, they can see as low as 10 targets per tumor cell, whereas a car sees about 100 targets per tumor cell. Um, and in either case now, we can engineer the avidity and affinity. We can make, um, by receptor engineering, we can uh, tune the T cell to the target. Um, and we have, um, uh, I've mentioned the difference in recognition uh, between a T cell receptor and an antibody-based recognition. And I'll show data. We now know that these kinds of cells can have the um, attractive part of the immune system, which is it can last lifelong. That's you don't have to recursively give these, unlike uh, drugs. That um, so, so we have data now on that. And so CARS then began initially as a, an experiment from basic science. Um, and in Art Weiss and his and colleagues at the University of California made the first CAR. And it was one really for um, to study how the T cell receptor works. And they took CD4, which also binds to the HIV envelope molecule, and made that, hooked that in cysts with a signaling molecule called the zeta chain from the T cell receptor. And they showed that replicated most of what the T cell receptor did. And then, it, and then in, it, in this case, would then also redirect cells to uh, HIV infected cells because this CD4 molecule binds the HIV envelope. Then um, Zeligeshar then made um, a, a major contribution by then hooking antibodies onto these signaling domains. And then, so then the specificity could be broadly changed using antibody recombinant technologies. And then the field has worked and is continuing to work to soup up the endogenous signaling domains with uh, molecules such as CD28 and 41BB in addition to these zeta chains. And I'll describe some of that. So the cars have become progressively more potent. These are called second generation because they have two signaling domains. and people have described third and fourth generations. Um, so a little bit of immunology here. We have uh, helper T cells in us that we learned about because of HIV. Um, if you lose your T cells, the CD4 cells, which happens with HIV infection, then you lose the control of your immune system. And there are four kinds of these CD4 cells. TH1 is what people have thought, and they have a, a transcription factor, a master transcription factor called TBET, that is required for, in most models, rejection of tumors. Um, and, and then these are the so-called Treg cells, which are a major target now because they suppress the immune system and prevent tumor. These are part of the reason people get tolerance to the tumor. Another kind of T cell is called the Th17 cell, which was discovered because it's really the one that does the most damage in many forms of autoimmunity. Um, and so we've recently said, well, maybe then they would be good at killing tumor cells as well and engineered them with CAR cells. And so this is... Um, because our initial studies have been with the Th1 cells. So Sonia Gaydon on my lab has made now CARs, where these are the antibody recognition motifs, and then systematically evaluated the co-stimulatory domains. And what we found in a series of publications is that ICOS will direct cells to become uh, uh, either to maintain the phenotype of being Th17 or to promote their differentiation that way to become these autoimmune-like cells. Um, and she's showing in, in some complicated mouse model systems where the mice have tumors and then CAR T cells are given that these, uh, that these CAR T cells actually work better than the ones we're using clinically um, right now in our, our, our trials. So these 
Um, I won't go into the details, um, but the, the takeaway points are that we make bipolar T cells, if you will, this way. They have both Th1 and Th17 properties if we incorporate the high cost based signaling domain. Um, and so this is data that was just recently published in blood. Um, it makes a more potent car that persists better in our preclinical models. We haven't yet tested these in human trials. Um, the first CAR trial was done actually in HIV and we, we collaborated with Cell Genesis, which was a biotech in uh, South San Francisco in the late 1990s to first test that CD4 Zeta CAR that was made at UCSF in patients who had HIV. And we published three papers in 2000 to 2002 where we treated 40 patients with this so-called first generation CAR. So they had HIV. They did not get any chemotherapy. And um, what we found in these three papers was the CAR worked in that we could find it in the patient, it expanded, and um, it had some antiviral effect, but it didn't cure people of HIV. And uh, cell genesis abandoned the uh, clinical development of that drug. Um, but what we have done then since is analyze the samples from these patients, because if you're on a, a gene transfer trial in the US, the FDA regulations are that you need to be um, followed at annual intervals for 15 years to exclude um, long-term toxicity, such as genotoxicity in this case, could the integrating viral vector that we use actually result in leukemia, T-cell leukemia. And we followed these patients where we had these samples now out past a decade, and there's not a single patient who's had a side effect. And uh, we found molecularly that there's no dangerous integration sites in these patients. They don't enrich over time and no adverse events in about 600 patient years of follow-up. And most surprisingly, we found that the survival rate, the half-life in these CAR T cells is more than 17 years in the patients. So when you do projected half-life decay rates, that means they're gonna last the less rest of the life in the patient. So a single infusion of these T cells has persisted out past a decade and in 37 out of 39 patients. So. Um, that's the first date on that. The first CAR trials were done in HIV, so we have the most meaningful data. Um, the cancer patients initially all died, so there's no long-term follow-up from them. So this is the first long-term follow-up to show that T cells are safe after genetic modifications at, significant, at clinically significant levels. Um, and then we began trials then with a second generation CARs, and, and as did other academic centers. Um, and our initial trials then uh, to test our second generation car was in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which um, has, um, once it becomes refractory to fludarabine-based chemotherapy, it's, it's, a, it's a disease that uh, no one's cured and it has poor uh, long-term survival. Um, it's the most common chronic leukemia in, in the US um, with about 15,000 cases a year. Um, so Mike Malone in my lab made a car that had several features that hadn't been done in previous trials with, for, with the so-called first-generation cars. He expressed an alenoviral vector instead of a murine gamma retrovirus. He used and showed that an endogenous promoter with EF1 alpha was best in human T cells. And then he compared systematically all the, the signaling domains, as I showed you, I caught, um, had been done recently by my uh, postdoc Sonia, where she looked at high costs. So what Mike did was compare form BB or CD28 or all three in a so-called third generation car. And when you put these cars into T cells, um, one of them, this is a semi-log plot, it's of uh, doubling rates of these T cells. So these are human CD4 and CD8 T cells. When you put this car in and don't give it target, which would be CD19, it's surrogate antigen, um, one car t uh, maintains proliferation of these cells longer than the rest, which the others have four uh, population doublings. And then unless you re-stimulate the cells, they die away. So this was an unexpected uh, finding, we found ligand independent proliferation here, and we reasoned that might give us a better effector to target ratio in our patients with leukemia um, who have many target cells, and the issue's always been how can you get enough effector cells. So, so we began a pilot trial in July of 2010 in CLL. David Porter led this trial at the University of Pennsylvania, and it was the first time that a lenivirus had been used in cancer patients and a car with a 4MBB signaling domain and, and this particular strong promoter to promote constitutive uh, expression. And so we used in that trial a 10-day manufacturing process where we activate peripheral blood cells from the patient and then introduce a lenivirus vector and then they're frozen at the end. 
uh, cryopreserved and then given to the patient a week later after uh, in, um, uh, chemotherapy. We've now decreased our, our manufacturing time down to five days. Um, so, so the drug is available in near real time, and the drug in this case is autologous T cells that have a CAR against uh, the CD19 molecule. And in the first three patients we tried, they had very refractory CLL. All three patients had dramatic responses. This one had a 17P deficiency, which is P53, the a gene that confers resistance to um, chemotherapy. And um, his leukemic count is shown in red, which and he shouldn't have any of those cells, but they're about 50 to 70,000 uh, per microliter here. And he got three courses of chemotherapy with basically a nitrogen mustard analog here um, over 80 days before the car infusion. And you can see that he was refractory to that. And then the cars caused rapid disappearance of the leukemic cells from the circulation. And, and two other patients are shown here who had our clearance of the tumor from blood, bone marrow, and lymph nodes. Um, so that was reported in August 2011, our first three patients. Um, and then um, we've had a landscape change in CLL or ibrutinib, which targets the BTK kinase, which is one of the drivers in CLL, um, uh, came out. And so now we, it's a very potent drug for CLL, but only about 5% of patients get CRs. This is a patient who had 10 prior therapies, had the P53 deficiency, and also became ibrutinib resistant. And he had a grapefruit-sized mass growing out of his chest, so that started as a lymph node um, that was radio resistant. So he'd had every therapy possible. We infused CARS, and um, he had a complete clearance of the tumor from his blood and bone marrow within two months. And at a year now, he has no more detectable tumor. So he um, is, is in, uh, in, in a complete remission now, where it failed uh, these previous therapies. So the generalities from those first three patients are that we could eradicate very large amounts of tumor with a single infusion of these CAR cells. They had up to seven pounds of tumor per patient. Um, um, you know, a kilogram of tumor is 10 to the 12th cells. And we infused 10 to the 8th cells. And what we could show is these CAR cells divided between 1,000 and 100,000 fold in the patients. So they're serially replicating. You know, they're a living drug. And we could show that each CAR T cell killed more than 1,000 tumor cells. So very different than standard drugs. So T cells can kill multiple times. And the immunologists call that the serial killer aspect. They use that normally to control viruses. Um, the remissions have been durable to date. Uh, two of those three patients that went in complete remission, now it's now actually four years out since they were treated uh, with a single uh, infusion of the CAR cells. Um, our best biomarker of this right now is the actual proliferative capacity of the CAR cells in the patient. Um, and um, this are the first 10 patients we had who had complete responses. And um, what this shows is, is measuring the CAR and peripheral blood using a PCR assay. So, and it's, it's uh, and expressing as copies per microgram of genomic DNA. And this red line shows where you would have 6% of your cells in the blood being CAR cells after this infusion on day zero. So again, an exponential semi-log plot. And all the patients with a complete response have uh, massive proliferation of the CARs in the blood uh, shown here. Um, we also measure that in the per in bone marrow. And here are four patients who didn't respond. And the CARs in graft, we can find them in the patients, but they don't expand that way. So, so replicative capacity is important, we think. We don't know yet the mechanism why, in some cases, the CARs ex uh, expand like this. In other cases, they don't, whether it's a cell intrinsic issue with the CAR T cells from the patient, or is it something in the tumor microenvironment. Um, so after we treated uh, CLL in, that, in those initial reports, we began treating acute lymphocytic leukemia, which is um, uh, a disease that uh, kills much more rapidly than CLL. And uh, we've now treated, um, have a report coming out where we've treated for the first 30 patients with ALL, of which um, 25 are pediatric and five are adults. And um, so they're all, they're all multiply relapsed, um, and 60% actually have, have already relapsed after a bone marrow transplant. And there are no FDA-approved drugs that have worked in that situation ever for relapsed 
leukemias after failed uh, bone marrow transplant. And um, what we'll report next week in the New England Journal is this, that there's a 90% complete remission rate. So that's, in a phase one trial is uh, really unprecedented to see a 90% CR rate. We see that in adults, similar, the same re rate of response as we do in children. Um, and so we now have the first person treated was Emily Whitehead, who became pretty famous on the New York Times. She's now out past two years, um, but we have a number of patients out um, with unmaintained remissions now after a single infusion in the car. So the overall survival rate at six months is almost 80%, whereas the, all the controls, it's less than a month. And uh, so the, the uh, median survival has not been reached. So it's a very potent therapy in ALL, uh, similar initial response rates have been seen at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and um, so that uh, these uh, ALL is something that really can be effectively treated with uh, CAR T cells. So we don't know the eventual role now of CAR T cells for these B cell malignancies. It may be a number of medical indications from consolidating patients who have minimal residual disease after induction chemotherapy to uh, reinduce remission in patients who've relapsed or to bridge them. The only thing that will cure usually adults with ALL is a bone marrow transplant. And uh, so uh, um, this may now replace that is our long-term goal. And Novartis has just begun multi-center trials. It's the first time that multi-center trials have been done with CAR T cells. Um, and in eight centers uh, will be across the U.S. in both pediatric ALL and then in adult ALL. And, um, and we, we hope that at one point maybe these CAR cells could re replace the need to have a bone marrow transplant so that pit one could use your own cells rather than have to go through the rigors of a bone marrow transplant. There are toxicities with this therapy and it's all been on target. So separate than the off-target toxicities you see with chemotherapy where there's nausea and vomiting and hair falls out and so on, that's off-target toxicity. What we see with um, the CARs are B-cell aplasia, so the normal B-cells are killed as well as the leukemic cells because they share the same CD19 marker. And that's given, uh, they, that's managed with replacement therapy, so they get gamma globulin infusions uh, every several months. The patients have had tumor lysis syndrome when these large amounts of tumor um, die away. And then they've had two re uh, related syndromes, which are characterized with high fever uh, predominantly, and it's called cytokine release syndrome or macrophage activation syndrome. Biochemically, these patients get very high levels of ferritin, uh, C-reactive protein, and D-dimer. And then in the serum, we see um, uh, really he, very high levels of interleukin-6 and interferon gamma. And now we're treating that with tocilizumab. Instead of, we initially treated this high fever and cytokine release syndrome with corticosteroids, and now we treat with tocilizumab, which blocks IL-6 signaling. And um, we found that this cytokine release syndrome is related to tumor burden which is something you would expect, basically having an amount of tumor cells and amount of T cells, the amount of side effects and the cytokines and inflammation that you would get is gonna be related to how much target you have. And so this is a plot of these, of 30 uh, patients in our report of the amount of bone marrow that's filled up with tumor. So in the, it goes up to 100% of the tumor can be, uh, bone marrow can be replaced with tumor. Then the chance, the side, the, um, incidence of uh, grade three or four, in this case grade four cytokine release syndrome, is much higher than if they have lower tumor burden going into the trial. So at this point, one third of our patients who have these high tumor burdens are treated in the ICU. They get 104 to 106 degree fever, can last about a week. They're sick. What we think from this data is, is that if we can move this more up front and treat patients who have lower tumor burden, who have had some initial chemotherapy and are still responding, then it would be an outpatient treatment. So the patients with low tumor burden have low side effects. If you have lots of tumor, then you have lots of inflammation, meaning high fever. Um, and um, so at this point now, there are a number of car companies, which, you know, uh, it's really changed the landscape since when I was here in May. Um, so there, this is not even a complete list of companies that are testing and developing cars at this point. And then the number of academic institutions in the U.S. and in 
um, non-U.S., uh, particularly in uh, China now, are developing CAR therapies. And the ones in red here are against targets on hematologic malignancies, and in black, um, targets on solid tumors. So um, uh, there's now it's gone from just a handful of people doing these to the accelerated rate of research uh, um, that we've seen. And this is the real scientific question in the field now, which is, you know, can this go and move beyond leukemia? not just, um, and, and into the solid tumors that are more common. Um, and so there are a number of trials in early stages now testing this. We just opened a trial for glioblastoma targeting the EGFR variant three. Um, and we're, we uh, will have one for prostate cancer and there's one open at Memorial Sloan Kettering testing PSMA. We have a trial testing a mesothelin specific car for these cancers. And I'll show some data here for a CMET car for triple negative breast cancer. So there's a number of uh, uh, trials underway, um, but it's, it's still unknown whether this will work. Now this is two years worth of work here on lung cancer where we tested a car against either mesothelin or uh, CMET. So CMET is on almost all metastatic adenocarcinomas. And, and here, these are 14 lung cancer lines, and we've stained in by flow cytometry in blue, either mesothelin expression or CMET. So this cancer cell line has both the irrelevant control, which is CD19, is shown in that gray line. And then this is an, an immunologic plot of a factor to target ratio, asking, can these CAR cells kill this lung cancer? Which is, this is a patient who died of lung cancer at our hospital, and we isolated this tumor cell line. And the answer is yes, it kills it as efficiently as we see in leukemia. And um, out of these 14 cases that we just picked at random, there were two that didn't kill. And one of those has no target, so there's, not either, there's no CMET or mesothelin there. Um, and then this one has target, but the CAR T cells didn't kill. This is an 18-hour lysis assay. So in general, we're seeing very good efficiency in a petri dish of these CAR cells when you target towards antigens that are on lung cancer lines that they can kill. So there, you know, trials haven't yet begun, and there's gonna be issues then of can the CAR T cells get to the lung, can they get to where the tumor is, and can they overcome the immunosuppressive effects and so on in the tumor microenvironment. But at least when you make it you know, mono a mono in, in vitro, they kill. So, which is good news, I think. It means we need to find out the other uh, issues to make it work. So, Julia Chu is a surgical oncologist at University of Pennsylvania. We have um, just at carrying out a phase zero trial, basically, to ask if you can kill breast cancer cells with CARs. And so, triple negative breast cancer, uh, Julia showed, um, expresses both CMET and mesothelin, unlike standard breast cancer that's either hormonally driven or driven by HER2. So they don't express mesothelin or, or CMAP, but these triple negatives do, and this is just an example. So about 40% are strongly CMAP positive. So uh, with Lawrence Cooper at MD Anderson, we've made a car against CMAP, and, and we're testing in this trial design. It's a phase zero trial just to ask what will happen to isolated metastasis injected with CMET CAR. So this is not systemic treatment intravenously. What this is is patients who have metastatic breast cancer that's triple negative. Details are shown here in clinicaltrials.gov, but the patient then, we manufacture CARs and we're using, with Maxite, we electroporate RNA into these cells, so they'll go away after a few days. So these are, we're not using a lantern vector. We don't think that CMET would be a great target for CARs right now because our, there's too many normal cells that have CMET. But we're just injecting these into the tumor, so into tumoral here, and then three to seven days later, the tumor gets surgically excised because of metastatic, usually chest wall lesion. And then we're asking then, are there CARs there and did it kill any tumor? So it's a, just a direct test of that, We're not an intravenous injection at this point. And um, so here is one example of the first patient, and this shows hematoxin and eosin here. Um, and this is an area where, um, this is, there's a needle track here, this is where the cars were injected. And then here, what, what we can see is, um, this is live tumor and then this is dead tumor. We were hoping to get something like that. And then this is what we're seeing, which is at that same area now, staining with CD68, which identifies macrophages. Macrophages can kill tumor cells and eat them up. Um, there's a lot of macrophages. So this is 
consistent with remodeling the tumor microenvironment. We're seeing that the cars have, in the area where they are injected, we find macrophages, and in other slides I'm not showing, we also find T cells and, um, and dead tumor cells. So in, in at least in situ when the cells are directly delivered there, a car cell can kill um, these carcinoma cells. We're not claiming this has any benefit to this patient. This is just to ask a scientific question. Um, so we're here in this point right now, I think, where there's an, an issue um, that we wrote about in Nature and Chris Mason wrote, wrote about of our global healthcare system learning how to deliver now cell-based therapies because we have you know, a pharma-based pillar, one that's biotechnology-based, and then one that's based on bio, I mean, uh, um, uh, medical devices. And we're moving towards a system where there will be, a, I think, a number of cell-based therapies. That's what this meeting basically is about. And um, in many cases, gene modified as well. So in our particular issue, the challenges are that it's so-called N of one manufacturing, meaning that each lot, each patient we treat is, is FDA released. So it's not the same as one shoe size fits all where we have one master cell bank and treat thousands of patients. It's this one, is, it's patient specific. And there's issues then of how you do that. Would it be done like the Red Cross does where they make patient specific red cells and you, and you know, if someone gets blood here and then you just store the cells to when they need it or will it be done in central manufacturing? The guidance we've had really from the FDA with these gene modified cells is that a central manufacturing is, is optimal for the control that you can get um, with gene modified cells. Um, so, you know, Novartis licensed our technology in um, uh, August of 2012. In May of this year in Forbes, Joe Jimenez was on the cover of, of uh, Forbes where I said, will this man cure cancer? And, and this is what he said, quote, I've told the team that resources are not an issue. Speed is the issue. So Novartis is trying to figure out how to commercialize this. It's a, it's a challenge because of the manufacturing issue. Um, and we were awarded an FDA breakthrough designation for this car therapy in July. And that's for two indications. It's um, ALL in children and ALL in adults. So there has been a lot of progress towards getting this done. Um, and, uh, but this was yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Um, if, if you can go, f you'll find this where it says, new costly cancer treatments face hurdles getting into patients. And uh, so they have diagrammed this, you know, the public does not understand these kinds of therapies because there are none really like this. The closest would be Provenge, which is a, an autologous dendritic cell given for prostate cancer. So there it starts from the patient, just as we do, but it's not gene modified. And, and all the things we do. So but this is what, what the car cycle is, is that, that we've discussed. And, and then the, the issue is, how do you get reimbursement for an expensive therapy that may be curative? And that's something we haven't faced in detail, and that's a central issue I've seen at this meeting. Um, and that's not my expertise. Um, so there are a number of issues that are required to be solved um, in order to make this work. Because um, right now you can get it at boutique cancer centers, but it's not available at community hospitals. So one is it needs to be automated and robots need to be able to do the manufacturing because there are not enough people to do this. You know, we can do it for relapsed pediatric leukemia, which is about 3,000 cases a year, but we can't do it for lung cancer because it would take some PhDs to grow these cells. So there's not the labor pool to do it. It needs to be done by robots. Um, we need to educate patients and physicians about the issues of cell-based therapies. Um, and um, one issue is the use of serum and cell culture, which I'll show, and, and whether or not we can get universal donor cells rather than each individual patient cell. So Chris Mason's group has shown this concept that we're headed towards a crisis in cell culture, and which is similar to the issue with peak oil. So the global supply of serum right now is used for several things. It's used in research, it's used by the vaccine industry, and then now car industries. And if, if, if we don't get serum-free manufacturing, we will run out of, um, there won't be enough serum to meet the demand. Because this is human serum that people get when they donate blood. So right now that's used in the, serum, in the cultures. So that needs to be removed and it needs to be serum-free. Um, um, the, the major steps so far towards using universal donor cells is this study published um, late last year, which was in um, 
using CD19 CAR cells, but using donor T cells. So this is people who'd had a bone marrow transplant, but not going back to the patient like we did, where that came out of the patient's arm, but going to the original donor. And they found, quite surprisingly, that there was no graft-versus-host disease. And they had, um, these are very late-stage patients, they had you know, some um, beneficial anti-tumor responses. So it may, this is a step towards universal donors. Um, and you know this issue has been talked about you know extensively in the biotechnology literature of using N of one cell therapies, and um, you know it was initially raised when uh, Provenge uh, was launched in 2010, but they've had quite significant manufacturing challenges, and and so the car field is going to have to get around that, and this is how cars are made in Detroit right now. You know they were initially made by Henry Ford and his you know, in, in uh, manufacturing uh, assembly lines, and technicians would put these together, the cars, um, and, and that they were scaled up, and now we, when you get a car, unless it's a very fancy one, they're all put together by 80% of the cars assembled without human hands, but using robots, which are what these are. And um, this is our current car manufacturing process that uh, treats patients where it's 10 days long, initially now it's down to five days, and um, we add beads to the cells that Life Technology here makes in uh, um, the San Diego area, then we, uh, in Carlsbad. Then we, um, and they import them actually from Dinell in Norway. Um, we then um, remove the beads at the end by passage over a magnetic field because they're paramagnetic. And then the cells are concentrated and frozen. And um, there's a lot of issues in there of when to feed the cells and so on that right now human intervention is required and that needs to be taken out. So I'll summarize here to say that the CAR cells now have been shown to have potent anti-tumor effects in uh, both leukemias and lymphomas and that they um, have uh, multi-center trials are now underway uh, in the US and they will be in Europe and, and Japan in a year or so. Um, and then number of trials are underway at various academic centers now testing in solid cancers um, for the issues that we discussed. Um, and uh, so I'd like to just uh, uh, give thanks to a number of people involved in these trials. Um, um, you know, Anchu has led our internal operations group. Sonia Gidon made the ICOS-based car that I mentioned. Uh, Bruce Levine does our, our cell manufacturing. And uh, David Porter and Noel Fry take care of the adult leukemia patients, and Stephen Grupp and a team uh, take care of the patients at uh, uh, the pediatric leukemia th uh, patients. And we have funding from a number of philanthropic uh, foundations as well as Novartis, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. So it's astounding how far it's come within cancer, but uh, can you just talk a little bit about beyond cancer, viral persistence or autoimmunity? That's one question. And the second one is, do you ultimately think this will be limited by the expression of the antigen on the tumor cell that is specific to the tumor cell, or do you think there will be a way around that? Okay, so, um, you know, we have worked with Sangamo for about a decade, and we had a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine this year showing in HIV that uh, you could edit out the HIV co-receptor, and then we found some quite potent antiviral effects where uh, some patients could control virus without needing drugs anymore. So that's ongoing studies. Sangamo is going to do a phase two trial. We have another one underway starting at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and that, what that is is really making cells um, resistant to infection, and that's one way to prevent a reservoir from spreading, I mean, as if, if it can't go from one cell to another. But we also need a better offense, if, if you will, to control, the, the goal being to get people so they um, don't have to take drugs every day. So I think that will happen. There's a number of approaches. It just has not, um, you know, there are about 25 FDA approved drugs right now for HIV, so it takes a lot longer to do trials than it does in cancer patients. But the principles are all there. Um, and then we will see the same kinds of thing in organ transplantation and autoimmunity, where you can grow the cells that suppress the immune system, which are a problem in cancer, but if you don't want to have autoimmune disease, it's what you want to amplify. 
And, and there are trials underway now with those so-called regulatory cells um, at our center at, and a numerous, there are a few companies now involved in developing regulatory cells that way. So, so I think we're gonna see this spread beyond um, cancer. It's just cancer is the easiest you know, from a developmental pathway to initially. Um, but the principles that we found in, in cancer have been what we found really in our preclinical models. So they've modeled. So, and what we see so far with the other kinds of therapy in HIV, chronic infections, um, and uh, autoimmune disease is that they have followed what we've seen in animal models. So I think that it just will take longer. Um, and then, you know, your question about there's, Human tumors are much more complex than most mouse tumors. And so there can be the issue of having the right target there. And then also, is, is there, you know, there are multiple subclones of which some may have the target and others not. So I, I'm pretty sure that in the end, we're going to use um, what we call combinations of cars, for instance, or T cell receptor cells. I, I call it a fleet of cars. If you, and, you know, so that. Um, and that will be information that we'll get from genomics. I mean, every patient will have their tumor tested, sequenced, and then you have to know what, what the targets really are. And um, some targets, uh, you know, the T cell receptor is maybe ideal or better suited for some solid tumors because it can see ways in a way different and may be able to find targets that are only on the tumor. Um, and so, so it's now turned out that many tumors that mutate create antigens. And then those you can then target or drug, if you will, with T cell receptors, so, and, and in some cases antibodies in cars. So, so that's, you know, the science of the field will move more and more. You know, we've, we've got the low-hanging fruit now with B cell leukemias. Um, I think we'll see other kinds of bone marrow derived uh, tumors like myeloma and, um, other leukemias be targeted, and then solid tumors now. And it may well require more combination therapies of solid tumors, which are genetically more complex. So you mentioned that in ALL you were um, having to replace normal B cells with beta globulin every few months. How far out would the replacement be? And if you have wide uptake of the therapy, would there be supply issues? So, um, Again, like ser human serum, you know, there will be a supply issue with gamma globulin. So, and uh, so right now, there's actual, they've done quantitative estimates. So the issue is, I mean, our patients right now need B cell replacement therapy. We knew from congenital immunodeficiency, so babies born without B cells, that you can live fine as long as you're given antibody replacement. Um, and um, so at this point, uh, our first patients that we treated are four years out now. And the, of the uh, CLL patients, and they're still getting the antibody replacement. Now, what we don't know is um, how long you need to have cars around. Okay, so there's, um, what, what we don't know, for instance, do the patients have a sterile remission? Did every last cancer cell get killed? Or are there some dormant cells, and then if you would get rid of the cars, the cancer would come back? There is data that suggests that's actually might happen. So in allogeneic bone marrow transplants, which really work because of the T cells from the incoming donor, um, it, it, when you immunosuppress patients, sometimes the cancer later comes back. And then there's data that's um, really quite scary where a woman who had, there's four cases like this I know of, where, where, where a patient was put into remission um, with metastatic melanoma and then um, in one case, 16 years later, she relapsed. I mean, she died of a stroke, and she had signed her driver's license. She donated all her organs to five other people, and they all came down with metastatic melanoma. And the first patient died, and then after that, because of the registry tracking, they said, listen, this patient had evidently microscopic residual melanoma. So they then stopped the immunosuppression. You know, the people got kidneys, livers, and hearts. They stopped the immunosuppression. They then rejected their organ, but they also rejected the tumor. So a classic teaching of immunology is that tumors are not transplantable. I mean, if you have a good immune system, you can't transplant in a tumor from someone else. It has to come from you yourself or your identical twin. So, so that patient evidently had dormant tumor for 16 years. We don't know if that's a so-called evidence of a tumor stem cell, of which there are companies here in this area studying those, or was it a cell that wasn't vascularized or whatever? She was clinically well, 
Um, so that would be an argument you want to have cars around for a long time. But if they have a sterile remission, then we can kill them off. So there are switches, so-called kill switches now, where you can kill the cars off in patients, and then you would stop the B cell replacement therapy that you're um, asking about. So I think what we're going to end up doing are, are clinical trials, where we end up manufacture, you know, two infusions worth of car cells, wait maybe three years of a patient's in remission, then kill the cars off, and then if the tumor comes back, you reinfuse them. If it doesn't, great. Then you don't have to do the B cell replacement. So that's where there's no animal model that will tell us that. Um, it's going to take a, a clinical experiment. Uh, yes. So the other side of personalized medicine is um, IPS cell-based therapy, in which you actually want to replace something, like for Parkinson's disease or uh, for heart disease. So I think the issue in both cases, however, is going to be one of cost, because as soon as you do an individualized uh, therapy, and there was just a 60 Minutes episode that I happened mm -hmm. to see last Sunday it was talking about the rebellion of doctors against really expensive cancer drugs. So I guess what I'm interested in is where's the price point where you can actually rationalize a single dose medicine that costs a million dollars as opposed to 10 years of therapy with a with hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, so I'm, uh, you know, that, that's going to need new reimbursement models um, and I'm not an expert in that. I think, um, I mean the Wall Street Journal thing from October 6 discussed you know, in the case of leukemia, you're replacing a bone marrow transplant, which, which can be a million dollars. And then, and then also you have the, you know, graft versus host disease and issues that can happen. So there, there will be ways to generate economic models. But I think in the end, I mean, there's been no effort until just very recently. The, ph the pharmaceutical industry knows how to scale things and make things cheaper. Okay, there's, that's not happened in the academic centers. So it's only now beginning. And so things will get cheaper by at least a log. Right now, you know, if um, our, um, without any profit, it cost us about $20,000 to make these car cells. Not the vector or anything, okay? Just, that's the manufacturing, that's the apheresis, growing the cells up and doing the FDA release tests. So that's the cost of goods, that's not depreciation or anything like that. And so, um, and that I'm sure will get a lot cheaper, so it's, it's, it's doable, um, I, and I think there's going to be IPS cells that will regenerate, for instance, people who have T cells that are bad. And if it works well enough, I think we'll find a way to make it work. I mean, if you have a therapy, it's right now, uh, many cancers, um, the therapy is a million dollars, and yet the patient still dies. It just takes, so it would be better to have, just like with vaccines, something that works well up front and then figure out how to pay for that, um, which um, there's some models on that, but that's, that's a big political discussion um, that I'm not going to be part of. <laughs> uh, yes. So you alluded to it, so I have to say it. So the, the problem with relapse is the number one cause of mortality in these diseases. So if there is a dormant cancer stem cell, wouldn't it make sense to target that together with the CAR T cell strategy? Are you thinking about that as a way we can work on it together? Yeah, so that has to happen. I mean, so cancer biology is, I mean, we haven't had the tools before to begin to even look at those issues. So we will uncover things like that that, um, and maybe make the cells differentiate. There are all sorts of things you could figure out on that that will need to be done. Um, um, so we need sensitive assays for one thing. We right now don't have good enough assays really to look at you know that issue. And then, um, but I think those those are good problems to have compared to what we had in the past to face. Can you, can you talk a little bit about resistance mechanisms and if, you know, if, the, if you're seeing any of that? Because tumor cells, you know, we, we know can uh, mutate and, and suddenly evade the immune system. Why, wouldn't it, why aren't we seeing it right now well, and when might we see it? So we have seen it, uh, and I did, our second patient we treated, and it was in the New England Journal, relapsed with a um, resistant tumor. And, um, and so we've seen it in that 30 patients, it'll be in the paper that comes out, We've seen it in 10% of the cases. And what we're seeing in that case is target loss. So initially a cell that's CD19 positive 
um, what we had in our, the second patient we ever treated, you know, she was in remission for two months and then tumor came back completely devoid of CD19. So I was mentioning, you know, this so-called fleet of cars where we could have a combination. So in that case, there was no intrinsic resistance of the cells to die. Her blasts could still be killed with, if we target another surface molecule. So target loss is gonna be relatively easy to deal with by um, having a, sort of an off-the-shelf warehouse of different kinds of antibodies, and then based on that, the patient's tumor type, you could target several and then prevent outgrowth. That's not any different than what we do in HIV, for instance, you know, having combination antivirals. Um, and so, um, but then there will be, at some unknown frequency probably, and we don't know, we haven't seen this yet, but either issues of the cell itself becoming resistant to T cell killing mechanisms, we, we would anticipate that's gonna happen sometimes, and then, um, or these issues like of the uh, tumor microenvironment, where, for instance, the checkpoint molecules that, that turn off the immune system. And, and in that case, there would be other kinds of therapies to deal with that kind of resistance, you know, using, for instance, some of the antibodies that Bristol-Myers is, is developing. So we'll see, you know, and, and so that's in leukemia. We have a, a good bit of data we don't know at all in the solid tumors, and, and probably resistance will be a, a bigger issue there. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.